A 2017 Vanity Fair article about the 1967 film Valley of the Dolls describes it as a beloved piece of shit. As this oxymoronic description suggests, Valley of the Dolls has always been divisive with audiences, where some see an unbelievably clumsy, old-fashioned, and uninspired soap opera, or a hackneyed, mawkish mishmash of backstage plots, others see, well, a camp classic. As Glenn Kenny put it for the Criterion Collection, distinctions such as great, good, and lousy hardly seem germane to a discussion of Valley of the Dolls. What it is, is messy, loud, revealing, tragic, triumphant, ugly, and beautiful. It is, in a word, captivating. Thanks in large part to its cast of leading women, Patty Duke, Barbara Parkins, Sharon Tate, and Susan Hayward, or in another universe, Judy Garland. When actresses star in a film that provokes strong reactions the way Valley of the Dolls does, it inevitably affects how they're perceived, the opportunities they get, and the way they're spoken about. That's what I want to explore in this video. What did these women hope to achieve by starring in Valley of the Dolls? Did its terrible reviews leave their careers flat? Did its infamy turn them into cult royalty? Ultimately, did it help them achieve their goals? Well, there are four main actresses in Valley of the Dolls, so answering those questions turned into a monstrously sized video very quickly. In order to make this process manageable for myself and hopefully more watchable for you, I split the story into two parts. In part one, I break down the plot of the film for those who may not know or may need a reminder. I run through the studio's motivations, who was nearly cast, and how the final cast came together. In the next video, I'll talk about what happened on set, what went wrong or right, depending on your perspective, and the aftermath of it all. Throughout both videos, you'll hear input from three interviews I conducted with John Epperson, also known as Lipsinka, Stephen Ribello, author of Dolls, 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 Deep Inside Valley of the Dolls, the most beloved bad book and movie of all time, and Academy Award-winning actress and director Lee Grant, who plays Miriam Polar in the film. Longer versions of those interviews will also be posted on my Patreon, which I will link in the description below. There's a lot of information that I'm purposely omitting from this video in order to keep it focused on these women. If you're dying to know more about the production history of the film, its sequel, or the context behind its popularity, please read Stephen Ribello's wonderful book or check out Broy Deschanel's video, Why We Love This Awful Movie. Okay, let's get started. There was only one novelist in the world today whose face is as well known to the general public as the titles of their books, and perhaps even better known than the actual contents of those books. Her name is Jacqueline Suzanne, and she can excite more hostility than any other writer since Judy LaMarche. Before Jacqueline Suzanne was a world-famous author, she was, at best, a locally famous actress. At 18, she landed a small role in the original Broadway production of The Women, and followed that up with a number of roles in mildly successful shows before nabbing a recurring television role on The Maury Amsterdam Show. She modeled, appeared in more TV shows, did commercials, but never really took off, so to speak. She was successful enough, however, to have been immersed in the entertainment world, to know its ins and outs and dirty secrets, to have seen some of its most famous faces in less favorable lights than a spotlight. These experiences were the foundation of Valley of the Dolls. The film is different from the novel in ways I'll expand upon later, but here's a quick summary of how the film plays out since that's basically what we're focusing on in this video. Valley of the Dolls is, in short, the story of how this girl Hey, I want to be famous. became this girl. In the land of gods and monsters. Anne Wells, a small town girl from idyllic New England, sets off to New York City to become a secretary at a theatrical agency, where she meets all of your typical show business types. There's Lion, her boss, a serial cheater who she obviously falls in love with, Jennifer, a showgirl who is more admired for her body and less for her talent, Helen Lawson, an established, respected Broadway diva, the type who'd ask for a talented younger actress to be fired from her show, and Neely O'Hara, said younger actress, on the verge of making it big. 
After Helen asks for Neely's dismissal, she makes a big anyway in movie musicals. And in order to keep up with the demanding pace of the job, she begins taking pills, which leads to serious addiction, mental crises, and decaying relationships. She and Helen duke it out in the bathroom, but while Helen may have lost the battle, she wins the war. And thanks to her resilience, I've had it rough before, I'm a barracuda. She continues with her career while Neely lands in the gutter. Neely Jennifer is forced into what is politely called nudies, that's all they are, nudies, in order to earn money for her new husband when a genetic condition prevents him from working. When she discovers she has breast cancer and will have to have a mastectomy, thereby losing the only asset she's convinced she has, Mother, I know I don't have any talent, and I know all I have is a body, and I am doing my best exercises. She takes her own life with pills. Anne briefly becomes a famous model by being in the right place at the right time, but can't seem to get Lion to commit. She too takes pills, but snaps out of it and returns home to leave the whole business behind. The novel, which is definitely more salacious than what I just described and what is eventually depicted in the film, received very conflicting reactions. The literary establishment despised it. It was not high art, it had no semblance of quality, and you wouldn't believe how persistently condescending journalists and critics were to Jackie Suzanne about this point to her face, though she handled it well, if I do say so myself. It's just fun. In other words, it doesn't have to be high art. It can be just fun. I think great fun is high art. You know, it bores me when people say every minute has to be intense and we must do something with every minute. I mean, relax, enjoy life. I feel rotten when I've spent four hours reading a bad book. I but just then you're hate very, you're very uptight. You think so? Yeah. And you don't ever get up in the middle of the night and say, Jacqueline, Suzanne, you're not really, really very artistic. You don't ever hate yourself and feel a Gina, little cheesy. Gina, I'd be awful sick if I got up in the middle of the night after selling 10 million copies. You don't read I Am Mary Dunn and you don't I never say, heard of that book. Oh, well. All right. I'd imagine that professional jealousy fueled some of that pretentious resentment because, well, when she says, how could I be mad with the number of sales I've had? She really had the numbers to support her. People ate this book up. It spent 28 weeks atop the New York Times bestseller list and stayed there for 65 weeks overall. Here's a helpful sense of scale from Rebello that shows just how popular the novel was. Valley of the Dolls would eventually be cited in the Guinness Book of World Records as what was then the single best-selling novel of all time, moving 30 million copies. That's bigger than Gone with the Wind, and topped by only the Bible, the Quran, and decades later, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Like, that's enormous. I mean, millennials, imagine that midnight launch party. Thanks to Suzanne and team's cunning marketing strategy, she became a verifiable celebrity author in her own right. She was on every, she was on every show. The book had sold out every place, every you know, was buzzing about it. And she was like the author of, of the year. You know, it was like they had her on those talk shows and it was like gossip, 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 gossip. What about this character? What about that character? And there was plenty to gossip about. Suzanne, as plugged in and interested in show business as she was, had an encyclopedia of stories and references in her brain that she used to create a coterie of characters suspiciously similar to real-life figures. Anne was believed to be Suzanne herself, or to some, Grace Kelly, who Suzanne actually knew growing up in Philadelphia. Neely, a snub-nosed girl with large brown eyes and curly brown hair, who'd been raised on the vaudeville circuits, came alive on stage, maybe married a gay man, and definitely developed a bad pill problem, could only be one person, Judy Garland. Most people interpreted the tragic, beautiful Jennifer as Marilyn Monroe, although it was more likely Suzanne based her on Carol Landis, who'd been a minor star for Fox in the 40s and with whom Suzanne was rumored to have had a brief affair. Nicknamed the Ping Girl, Landis was a blonde bombshell whose persona had more to do with her chest than her skill, which she pushed back against. Just because she has a figure, she doesn't want you to think she can act. Helen Lawson was interpreted as an indictment of Ethel Merman's diva behavior. Suzanne allegedly also had an affair with her, although that relationship apparently evolved into something of an unhealthy fixation and eventually soured into something completely bitter and unmanageable. 
Suzanne obviously denied that the characters were based on anyone specifically and that they were composites of types of girls in Hollywood, but really no one bought that. A lot of people kept buying the book though, and what do we do with popular books? Turn them into movies. The story of how 20th Century Fox acquired the film rights to Valley of the Dolls is quite complicated, so for an in-depth look at that, I'd refer you to Dolls, Dolls, Dolls. What's important to know here, though, is that they got extraordinarily lucky and bought the rights before the book even came out. So when it did really well, they suddenly had an enormously valuable property on their hands. They assumed that the book's popularity would fizzle out quickly. It wouldn't. So they immediately started putting a film together to capitalize on it. It's worth at this point to think about how 20th Century Fox imagined Valley of the Dolls coming to life and why the studio might have been interested in it in the first place. There are several ways to understand the novel Valley of the Dolls as a valuable film property. First, the cast would slot neatly into an old Hollywood tradition. 20th Century Fox loved, and, and by 20th Century Fox in, this, in that day, I mean Daryl Epsanek. So Daryl Epsanek loved three girl movies. He'd been doing it forever. He did it at Warner Brothers when he was there. He carried that over to 20th Century Fox. So, you know, whether, whether you have them as musicals, whether you have them as hybrids, they all have, a, you know, kind of a similar sheen and, and feel to them. Three Corns in the Fountain, uh-oh, Valley of the Dolls, the remake of Three Corns in the Fountain called The Pleasure Seekers. And there were other studios, I guess, so three on a match. Was it Warner Brothers? There was Sally, Irene, and Mary at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. They did Our Dancing Daughters. Second, the addiction drama was something audiences had demonstrated interest in. Drugs have been in Hollywood films since the beginning of time. But after World War II, when the social issue film became popular, addiction began being portrayed more in a serious light. The man with the golden arm showed Frank Sinatra trying to kick a drug habit, for example, while The Lost Weekend and Days of Wine and Roses tackled alcoholism. So did A Star is Born and All Cry Tomorrow, both of which added another dimension to the addiction drama, show business. Audiences have always been interested in how the talented, beautiful people they've been trained to love fall from grace. We love to gawk at a sinful industry and the ways it greedily destroys lives. By the late 1960s, as stories of icons gone too soon became more and more prevalent, that kind of film became its own trope too. The Goddess was a fictionalized composite of Marilyn Monroe and Ava Gardner. Inside Daisy Clover was this meme about Judy Garland. And The Carpetbaggers was very loosely based on Jean Harlow and Howard Hughes. The Carpetbaggers highlights another reason Fox should have been confident about Valley of the Dolls. That film was also based on a best-selling novel by Harold Robbins that ruffled the establishment's feathers because of its controversial portrayals of sex and violence. In fact, the New York Times review of the book opens like this. It was not quite proper to have printed the carpetbaggers between the covers of a book. It should have been inscribed on the walls of a public lavatory. The film wasn't well reviewed, but it did really well at the box office, which is an incentive enough in and of itself. But here's the thing, books with that kind of reputation could be well reviewed. Studios used to care about that kind of thing. The blueprint for that kind of film was Peyton Place, a 1957 film based on a novel of the same name by Grace Metallius, in which a small waspy town in Maine experiences every gasp-worthy situation one could possibly imagine in one 300-page book. Like Valley of the Dolls, it spent over a year on the New York Times bestseller list despite its alleged literary shortcomings. 20th Century Fox picked up its rights and turned it into a prestige drama that landed nine Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture. Uh, they'd taken an unfilmable novel and, and somehow um, not only made it palatable enough, um, they made it seem worthy of importance and worthy of a big star, say like Lana Turner in her day, you know, doing uh, Peyton Place. Fox, then led by Daryl Zanuck and his son Richard Zanuck, never had a unified vision for what the eventual film Valley of the Dolls would look like, more on that in part two, but they did have every reason to believe that they could carve a good film, or at the very least, a profitable film, out of Suzanne's novel. Here's where I'd argue they made their first mistake. To direct the film, they hired who else but Mark Robeson, the director of Peyton Place. 
On paper, it made sense. If the goal was to class up a D-class A novel, he'd already shown he could do it. He'd been a reliable director for many, many years. However, as we'll see, no one had a good experience with this man. He, he was just a terrible threat. And they probably would have been better off with someone else. Obviously, the cast would also be enormously important to the film, and that's why we're here, so let's get into it. According to Ribello, screenwriter Dorothy Kingsley had begun telling the press, at the moment, our feeling is to go with unknowns in most of the parts. We don't need big names for the box office. The book is our star. Robeson agreed, but Zanuck and producer David Weisbart hoped to land big stars for all the roles. All kinds of actresses would come up in the process. Jane Fonda, Jill St. John, Faye Dunaway, Lucille Ball, countless others. But ultimately, they'd end up splitting the difference, finding actors who were well-known, but not yet movie stars in the traditional sense. The men proved more difficult to onboard. They went to the Albert Finneys and the Peter Finches. And first of all, all the big men thought it's a, mo- it's a women's movie. And why would I do that? So, you know, so you don't get Christopher Plummer. But the names of major actresses cross their desks and ring their phones trying to be seen for a role, including Miss Betty Davis, who was convinced she'd be perfect in the role of Helen Lawson. So was Jacqueline Suzanne, who, although she had no official input in the casting process, didn't shy away from giving her two cents whenever it asked for it by a journalist. She told one paper, she's such a marvelous actress that she couldn't be bad. Betty has said she knows what kind of person Helen is and feels she knows how to play it, that she knows about an aging star's lonely life. Davis literally knew it, but also by this point in her career, routinely played it on screen as well, cast as stars struggling to balance their egos with a decline in popularity as they age. The star, all about Eve, whatever happened to Baby Jane. Baby Jane had given Davis's career a much needed boost at a low point, and she hoped that Valley of the Dolls would cause a similar revival in the late 60s. Of course, there was an elephant in the room. Who'd do the singing? Davis did sing in Baby Jane, but her voice, well, it's not great. And that worked for Jane, who was supposed to seem delusional and untalented, but she'd definitely have to be dubbed for Helen. For Anne, Suzanne gave another blunt suggestion. I'd want Grace Kelly, she said, if Grace would lose 10 to 15 pounds. Obviously, that was never going to happen. Miss Kelly was off in Monaco and also rude. But this was Hollywood in 1967, baby. You're never gonna be more than five square meters away from a thin blonde. The production team became most interested in casting Candace Bergen and relentlessly pursued her. Bergen had starred in just two films by 1967, The Group and The Sand Pebbles. The group had some similarities to Valley of the Dolls. Like The Carpetbaggers and Peyton Place, it was based on an enormously popular but controversial novel that followed a group of young women throughout their lives, was criticized for its contents, and for allegedly not being well-written. Of course, men mostly said this. In the film version, Bergen plays the beautiful and cool Lakey, who leaves for Europe to make art, and returns at the end of the film with her rich girlfriend. It's not one of the largest roles in the film, but Bergen is startlingly captivating, both because of her beauty and also because of her quiet confidence, which can read as very grounded intelligence. She's a smart choice for Anne. No one would question her having a wealthy New England pedigree, nor her sudden ascendance as a model. Her composure would translate well as an instinct to preserve her dignity, motivating Anne to turn her back on the business altogether. By January 1967, Bergen was actually reported to have won the role, but slowly and discreetly distanced herself from it. Candace Bergen, who's always been really smart, knew it was ridiculous and decided She wanted to go make movies in Greece with big directors and other other sorts of things. Introducing the fabulous Raquel Welch, the sensational star discovery of this or any other year in one million years BC. If anyone could understand what it meant for Jennifer North to be referred to as the body, it was Raquel Welch. I was surprised you didn't introduce me as Raquel Welch and here they come. That's usually what I do. (laughs) Welch moved to Los Angeles in the early 60s and teamed up with business manager and eventual husband, Patrick Curtis, to help jumpstart her career. After a few truly minuscule roles on television and in films, she landed a contract at 20th Century Fox. The studio went to great efforts to publicize their future star so that by 1966, 
Welch became known as the movie star nobody had ever seen. Not on screen, anyway. Although she'd made two films, Fantastic Voyage, a sci-fi in which a nuclear submarine is shrunk down and injected into a man's body to fix a blood clot, and One Million Years BC, in which she played a bikini-clad prehistoric woman who falls in love with a caveman from a neighboring tribe, neither film had been released yet. She seemed to be everywhere else, though. Articles, features, on the cover of dozens of magazines throughout Europe, each one emphasizing her beauty and her figure, particularly how she looked in that bikini. By the way, One Million Years BC was a remake of a 1940 Carol Landis film. By the time casting for Valley of the Dolls rolled around, the parallels between Jennifer North and Raquel Welch were too great to ignore. Sure, hardly anyone knew how talented Raquel Welch was, but she had the body. Audiences had to believe that people would want to ogle Jennifer, and Welch, by and large, guaranteed that. Given that she was under contract at 20th Century Fox, she consented to testing for Jennifer, and in March 1967, was reported to have won the role. Indeed, her test convinced the producers that she was perfect, but Welch hesitated. Although Fox, Curtis, and Welch herself had deliberately built up her persona as a sex goddess, her interviews from this time indicate a bit of discomfort with that status and a constant effort to either complicate the definition of a sex symbol or explain why she hoped to transcend that label. They always put that symbol, they always put that symbol on somebody who becomes successful in pictures, the new sex goddess or sex symbol. Does it, does it rankle you a little bit? Not anymore. In the, in the beginning, I used to get a little bit perturbed because it seemed to, I don't know, there seemed to be a stereotyped idea of what a sex symbol was, sort of vapid and, and uh, not too bright and not with much ability or... Doesn't hold true, really. Well, I don't know if it does or not, but it's kind of, it makes you... Uh, feel that you're limited in some way, and so you kind of fight against it. She hinted at that frustration in another interview, saying, I've studied all my life to be an actress, but it's very difficult for someone to have a diversion constantly thrown in their face. The body, the body, the body, constantly, constantly, constantly. Perhaps it's understandable, then, that she wasn't necessarily enthusiastic about playing a character who literally says, I know I don't have any talent, and I know all I have is a body, a character whose body ultimately casts her as a victim, Welch believed playing Jennifer wouldn't necessarily progress her persona in a positive way. It's not like she'd been making Shakespeare or anything. Valley of the Dolls probably would have been a step up from something like this. But one can understand why she might have hoped for other, better quality opportunities down the line. She refused and Fox threatened her with suspension from her contract. Although Valley of the Dolls is very much about a trio of women, Neely O'Hara carries much of the film on her shoulders. A combination of glamour, big scenes, even bigger emotions, the role is very demanding. Whoever played her would have to be believable as a star of movie musicals. She'd need to have the dramatic capability to break down, the vulnerability to hit rock bottom, and the gumption to pick herself up again. Unsurprisingly, with so much to chew on, a lot of young actresses wanted to play Neely, and given the contents of the film, many of them also saw the role as an ideal vehicle to update their personas. Debbie Reynolds was one such actress, eager to evolve out of the sparkling clean image fostered by MGM. Reynolds obviously could perform Neely's musical numbers, and because she, much like Judy Garland, essentially grew up at MGM, she had firsthand experience with the behavior Valley of the Dolls describes. In her memoir, for example, she describes filming the good morning sequence in Singing in the Rain at 19 years old for over 12 hours a day, aching all over her body until she became virtually bedridden with exhaustion. The studio had its own MD who wanted to administer what they called a vitamin shot, amphetamines, possibly the same ones Reynolds wrote that ruined Judy Garland. She refused. Of course, Reynolds did not get the role, but if she had, it definitely would have added a wild dimension to Postcards from the Edge. Anne Margaret, star of musicals like Bye Bye Birdie and Viva Las Vegas, was similarly pursuing meatier roles that might help her move beyond her chipper, more juvenile persona. Apart from The Cincinnati Kid, she hadn't quite been successful. The Swinger is one of the most ridiculous movies I've ever seen. Drop it and get over here this instant. Karen, I can. You see, we came across this orgy in Laurel Canyon. At the time, this might not have inspired confidence that she was capable of Valley's more dramatic bits. 
However, if you've seen Carnal Knowledge, you would know that this film is absolutely within her wheelhouse. Granted, that's with Mike Nichols, an actual good director of actors, so... Anyway, Natalie Wood also wanted to play Neely. As an actress who had actually successfully transitioned into adult roles despite growing up in front of the camera, Wood in many ways seems like a natural choice. West Side Story and Gypsy had proven her musical bona fides, kind of. Not to mention the fact that she had basically already played, G sorry, I mean Neely in Inside Daisy Clover, a rags to riches story of a movie musical star, her queer husband, and her mental health issues. Still, Wood never seemed to hit with the producers, at least for Neely. At one point, she was reported by The Hollywood Reporter as having been cast for Anne, with Lee Remick playing Neely. Remick, like Wood, would have been a more prestigious option. From her film debut in A Face in the Crowd to films like Anatomy of a Murder, Remick had a demonstrable ability to channel emotions that might have worked really well for Neely. She could play the eye-catching performer, she could show a loss of innocence and maddening anxiety. Anyone who's heard the original cast recording of Anyone Can Whistle will tell you that she can sing. And then of course, there's Days of Wine and Roses, her Academy Award nominated performance in 1962, same year as this, in which she plays a woman who takes a slippery slope from two cocktails for lunch to full-blown alcoholism. It's easy to draw the literal one-to-one -one comparison and say Remick would have been comfortable playing someone in the throes of addiction. But thinking about that performance reminded me of something Lee Grant said in our interview. If an actor explores being drunk, they explore it the way Stanislavski tells you to explore it. You find it. You don't go splaying all over the place. Playing drunk isn't just being sloppy. And I think Remick shows exactly what that means in Days of Wine and Roses. Yes, she slurs her words and struggles to remain upright, but there's a stillness, a desperation discernible on her face that only comes from a deep probing of a character's emotions. It's an intelligent interpretation that makes me curious about what she might have done with Neely in another universe. Remick didn't work out, and neither did the actress seemingly everyone agreed would have been perfect for Neely, Barbara Streisand. By 1967, Streisand had yet to make her film debut, but was quickly becoming a household name. She'd already won multiple Grammys, an Emmy, and had been nominated for the Best Actress in a Musical Tony for Funny Girl, which she lost to Carol Channing in Hello, Dolly, which appears in Valley of the Dolls because 20th Century Fox had already bought the film rights to that, which Barbara later starred in for 20th Century Fox. Anyway, if it were 1966 and you were looking for someone who could sing, and who could conceivably be perceived as the heir apparent to Judy Garland or Ethel Merman, you would be looking for Barbara Streisand, who completed the Holy Trinity in real life. How about this Barbara? Yeah, isn't this great? great? The new belter. Streisand was Jackie Suzanne's choice for Neely. Clearly, she'd been thinking about her while writing the book, given some of the hints she drops about the new young girl who replaces Neely when she's worn out. She's the new young girl on Broadway in 1964. And Suzanne says she's a waif with a crooked smile and a big powerhouse singing voice and loads of charisma. And the show she's in is called Honey Bell. Two words. Well, what does that sound like? To me, it sounds like funny girl. This character is briefly featured in the film and I mean, Come on, settle, right? As meta as Streisand's casting might have been, the likelihood she'd ever accept the role was pretty low. The timing wasn't quite right, and more importantly, her team wasn't very enthusiastic about the film. Had she accepted the role, Valley of the Dolls would have been Barbara Streisand's film debut. We can't say for sure how the final film might have qualitatively differed had she played Neely, but regardless, the film's subject matter all but guaranteed a very different course for her career than Funny Girl ultimately did. Streisand, never one to gravitate toward gritty, messy material in the first place, made the much safer decision to make her debut instead with a story she knew well, had perfected, and had made her very famous. So we know who wasn't cast. It's time to find out who was and why they were chosen. She's today's kind of girl, bursting with youth, beauty, vitality, and hope. The Hope was born two years ago at the MGM Studios in Culver City, California, in the offices of producer Martin Ransahoff. It began with a contract with Filmways, 
and an intensive program of lessons, study, and training to become a movie star. As the narration said, Sharon Tate's journey to movie stardom began when she signed a contract with Martin Ransahoff, a producer and co-founder of the production company Filmways. Well, it began slightly earlier, but holy shit, this is a long video. Ransahoff placed Tate in a number of his productions, including a cameo in The Americanization of Emily, a small speaking role in Mr. Ed, and the recurring role of Janet, the beautiful secretary on The Beverly Hillbillies. Ransahoff believed that Tate could be a major star, but initially kept her away from large roles, opting instead to provide her with the training she'd need to become a successful actress. For 30 months, nobody outside of Filmways knew I existed. I was told I was a secret, she told one paper. I was taught speaking, walking, dancing, fencing, and of course, acting. Sometimes Mr. Ransahoff would give me a bit on a television show, but always in a black wig under another name. Eventually, he placed her in 13, or Eye of the Devil, a British horror film in which Miss Deborah Carr realizes that her husband is part of a cult that engages in ritual sacrifice. While in London, after filming ended, Tate met Polish director and future fugitive Roman Polanski, who was planning to cast his upcoming comedy horror, The Fearless Vampire Killers, a truly inexplicable film. He, of course, selected her, which kickstarted the Polanski-Tate lore, which we will talk about more in part two. Tate was then sent back to America to film Don't Make Waves, a beach comedy with Tony Curtis. Meanwhile, Filmways and MGM went full steam ahead with Sharon's publicity, most of which emphasized her beauty and sex appeal. Publicity can help make the difference between Sharon Tate, the actress, and Sharon Tate, the star. And the first step is to have pictures. Lots of them. For example, MGM distributed 10,000 copies of a four-page color brochure of Tate to exhibitors and press representatives around the country that showed her extensive press coverage while filming in Europe. They made a little documentary about her. Newspapers alerted audiences to look out for the new prospective glamour girl. Her appearance in Eye of the Devil was the molding of a star. She was touted as a secret sex missile, the next sex siren. One paper mused, the movies are as cannily industrialized as General Motors and audiences are wiser. And between them, they seem to have lost the magic somewhere along the way. Then comes a story that can almost make a fellow believe in Hollywood legends all over again. The story, for instance, of Sharon Tate, the instant star. It's important to note though that much like Raquel Welch, this publicity ran in advance of her film's releases. So even though the press was singing her praise, even though her persona as the new sex siren had essentially been solidified, no one had actually seen Sharon Tate in a film yet, nor would they until late into 1967, after Valley of the Dolls had already been filmed. Welch is an interesting touchstone when considering why Tate was cast and why she chose to accept the role. Given how similarly the two were marketed, the producers at Fox certainly would have seen Tate as a viable option should Welch say no. When she did, they called Tate in for a few screen tests, one of which is available on YouTube. Tate is so soft-spoken and gentle, she reads almost naive, wary, but excited. It's a very charming test and ultimately, I think, better than that scene in the final film, which is not the last time I will say that. It does make me question what Welch's must have been like because I don't see them as similar actors at all, but anyway, the test was enough to convince Robeson and she was offered the role. Tate then had to consider many of the same questions Welch had to consider. What would it mean for her career to play the body if she'd already spent an entire movie, like Welch, frolicking around in a bikini? She similarly understood that being considered a sex symbol had its drawbacks. Jennifer is referred to as the body beautiful, and uh, you're a very lovely girl, and it's certainly good casting. But that's a label that most actresses don't like. Do you resent it? Well, I don't mind if, if I have a nice body or someone says I'm nice looking, but I, the whole tag <clears throat> put together, the conception of it, <clears throat> excuse me, is, uh, I don't think, very complimentary because a lot of times it comes out the wrong way. But where Welch wanted to distance herself from Jennifer because of their similarities, Tate embraced her sympathy for the character as a motivating factor. Did you see yourself in the role of Jennifer? Well, out of, out of all the characters in the book, that was the one that I liked the most, the one that I 
had sympathy for, really. Additionally, Tate appeared to recognize her inexperience and seemed comparatively game to work on anything that might improve her skill set. But what is the best advice as a young actress that you've been given? Work. <laughs> Just go to classes, study, because it doesn't come easy. It's a lot of hard work. So she accepted the role. Valley of the Dolls would become her fourth film, another that, upon its eventual release, would hopefully justify the massive publicity she had already received. Paul Burke, Tony Scotti, and Alexander Davion are all in the movie. This is the continuing story of Peyton Place. Fans of meanness and evil triumphant have a new champion this season, proclaimed the Hartford Current. In what seems like no time at all, Barbara Parkins, the Betty Anderson of Peyton Place, has worked her way into the hearts and hisses of all America. Once again, Peyton Place appears in Valley of the Dolls lore, this time in the form of the 1964 soap opera television adaptation, and thanks to Barbara Parkins, the film's eventual Anne Wells. Barbara Parkins moved to Los Angeles from Canada as a teenager, where she enrolled in dance and acting lessons. Discovered at Desilu Actors Workshop, she was signed to a seven-year contract with 20th Century Fox for film and television. She appeared in a few small roles on television shows, but her real breakout moment was on the aforementioned Peyton Place as Betty Anderson, a character described in the novel as having the morals of an alley cat. If you've seen the film, you probably recognize Betty as this girl. She's pretty, popular, a little bit of a partier. You're meant to judge her until you're persuaded to root for her and her boyfriend Rodney against his annoyingly classist and judgy parents. TV Betty is kind of like that. Rodney is there, of course. But this being a soap opera, Betty has plenty more going on than she has in either the novel or the film. Affairs, alcoholism, pregnancies, a car accident, etc., etc. Now, everyone presumed that Mia Farrow, who was playing the novel's protagonist, Allison, would become the show's breakout starlet. But before long, it became clear that Parkins had actually seized that title. In fact, her character became so well liked that the show's producers actually planned a spin off for her, but ultimately decided against it when Peyton Place's sponsors insisted that they didn't want to lose such a popular character on the show. She had caught the eye partly because she's a capable little actress, but mostly because she seems to have an inner fire. She's a volcano in a tight dress. It's important to emphasize here how big Plate and Place was as a series. At the peak of its popularity, the show aired three new episodes per week, 52 weeks of the year with no reruns, meaning Parkins had a lot of opportunities to endear herself to America, either because they loved Betty or loved to hate Betty. So by the end of 1965, she was nationally recognizable with her career rapidly orbiting stardom. Of course, beaming into people's living rooms as a fictional character almost every day of the week also has its drawbacks. Soon people began approaching Parkins as if she actually were Betty Anderson, which understandably rubbed her the wrong way, not only because a, that erased her real identity, but also because B, if your main goal is to become a major star, which hers was, you need people to know what your name is. So Barbara actively began pursuing ways to differentiate herself from Betty. First came a Playboy shoot, which she claimed she did because she had done 40,000 close-ups in Peyton Place as Betty Anderson from here up. She holds her hand at chin level. I wanted to make people aware I had a body. And second, she became more vocal about her ambitions and her intent to eventually move on from the series. There's a rumor going around that uh, you may try to get out of Peyton Place. Any truth to this? Uh, that's a possible rumor. Um, I think after three years that people get tired of doing the same thing, so naturally it's a normal instinct for a person wanting to get out and do other things. And when you become bored with something, that isn't much fun. So when the studio under which she had a long-term contract happened to be producing one of the most highly anticipated films of the year, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to make the leap out of Peyton Place and into stardom. Parkins was interested in playing either Jennifer or Neely, but pretty much like everyone else, found the dramatic components of Neely's character more compelling and went to bat to get the role. Her screen test is on the Criterion Blu-ray, and to be honest, 
she wouldn't have made a bad Neely, albeit a very different one from Patty Duke. Instead, she was offered the literal only one of the three main characters who she had no specific interest in playing. But when I did test for Neely, um, uh, Mr. Robeson said that there was a velvet quality to my character that uh, Neely is, I f- identify with Neely more of, it's like sandpaper. And I could never, um, I could never get that, that crust to it that uh, I think Patty put across beautifully. But an opportunity is an opportunity, so during her hiatus from Peyton Place, she joined the cast and prepared to assume her place among the movie stars. I didn't include the character Miriam in my summary, but Miriam is Jennifer's sister-in-law who she ends up living with when her husband gets sick. Now, I made a video about Lee Grant's Oscar win for Shampoo that dives deep into her career, but in case you don't want to invest in that, here's Lee summarizing it herself. My first film, and only film, at night in 1952 was Detective Story. Okay, for which I was given the, the, the French prize, the Cannes Film Festival Award. I was 22 and I was nominated for an Oscar. I was married to a communist then, and unless I named his name, I will be blacklisted from film and television for 12 years. Okay, so somewhere at 32 or three, life changed. The blacklist was over and Peyton Place called me and in breaking the blacklist gave me the part of Stella to come back into approval again in a very, very good part on the most popular TV show in the country. That's right. Peyton Place once again rears its operatic head in our story. When it came to accepting the role of Miriam, Grant gives a very blunt and refreshingly honest answer. Her agent sent her the script and, well... You know, I need the money. So every film that came along, I made decisions about, you know, is this this worth doing or not? And how much does it pay? Because I uh, I had a daughter and I had to keep, you know, the two of us going. We were living in Malibu. You know, it's very expensive. And I'd been blacklisted for 12 years. So, you know, my choices were head of the household. I have to do. She wasn't the only one who needed the money. No Phoenix in entertainment rises from the ashes as often, as well, as emotionally, and as happily received as Judy Garland. This sentence, I think, sums up where audiences were at with Judy Garland in the 1960s. On the one hand, they loved her performances and appreciated her presence whenever they got it. But on the other hand, there were a lot of ashes, presumably from all the bridges burned throughout her career. If you're watching this video, I'm going to assume you have the basics of Judy Garland's story down. I don't think I need to rehash where she comes from, the things that made her popular, or the hurdles that she faced in the early stages of her career. If you need a refresher on that, check out this video I made. Instead, I'm going to contextualize what Judy was up to when Valley of the Dolls, the novel, was released in 1966. Here's what the average American would have read about Judy Garland in the newspaper in the years since the release of her last film, 1963's I Could Go On Singing. Her television show lasted just one season on CBS, which had surprised no one, although in reality, this wasn't really her fault. She went through a nasty divorce and custody battle with Sid Luft, in which he publicly detailed her multiple overdoses and suicide attempts. She got married to her fourth husband, Mark Herron, then promptly divorced him in December 1966. She canceled several shows. Her finances were so mismanaged, or more accurately, so many people stole from her, that the IRS came calling for hundreds of thousands of dollars in back taxes. And in March 1967, she was forced to sell her home. Her biographer, Gerald Clark, writes, When she lost her house in the spring of 1967, Judy also lost the semblance of normal existence. For the next two years, she was little more than a vagabond, darting from town to town, hotel to hotel. Put simply, Judy Garland was very publicly going through it. She was dead broke, deeply addicted to pills and alcohol, and unable to work on a consistent basis. 
It's no wonder then that when Fox came calling, asking Judy Garland to play Helen Lawson for a hefty fee, she jumped at the opportunity and signed the contract the same month that she sold her home. At this point in her career, everybody considered Judy Garland unreliable. Stories about her lateness, sudden cancellations, firing, and mysterious illnesses had filled newspapers for the past two decades. To hire her meant to take on an enormous risk. Which begs the question, if you're Fox, why do it in the first place? For all the drama in Garland's personal life, she was still very highly regarded as a performer. Alongside all of the articles in the 60s detailing the valleys are reviews highlighting the peaks. Every so often, a concert would actually happen, and without fail, she received rave reviews for the kinds of performances that had made her one of the greatest stars of all time. Most of her collaborators who witnessed her hardest moments often said things like, it may take a while, but once you actually get her to do what she needs to do, boy, it's worth it. To add an artist of that caliber would be a coup for any film, and Fox, apparently, was willing to take that gamble. Garland also had one very important aspect of Helen Lawson down pat. She could sing. She could play a magnetic, resilient, and experienced performer. And yet, the thing is, Helen Lawson is all of those things, but she's also, well, kind of a bitch. She's rude, selfish, confrontational, basically the antithesis of Judy's persona. I think it was Charles Bush who said to me, Judy Garland would be so wrong for that character. You just can't imagine her playing someone tough like that. Judy Garland's stock and trade was vulnerable and sympathetic. I can't see her doing it. She says in the final scene where you do feel sorry for her a little bit, she says, I'm a barracuda. Well, Judy Garland was never a barracuda. So it's odd that she would even sign up to play a character who is so unsympathetic. Although she, like I said, she does have her little sympathy moment at the end of the movie where she says, oh, you'll wind up like me and wonder what the hell happened. Garland could surprise audiences with her dramatic capabilities. Take her Oscar-nominated performance in Judgment at Nuremberg, for instance. But here, with this specific film and these specific characters, her casting read not as a thoughtful consideration of the role or her talent, but as a gag. Because, as I mentioned earlier, the other thing everybody was thinking about in 1966 was that Neely O'Hara was based on Judy Garland. Casting her added a meta element of epic proportions that would ensure the film considerable attention from the press. It also protected the studio from Garland herself. For one thing, if we get Judy Garland, and we pay her well, she maybe won't sue us, <laughs> you know, because Neil O'Hara is Judy Garland, no matter how you slice it. Judy Garland had read the book or started to, and um, there are actually tapes of her talking to friends and not such friends uh, who recorded her without their without her knowledge, where she's talking about she just couldn't get through the book because she thought it was so terrible. The gimmick of it all leaves a sour taste in my mouth you really have to question whether or not it was an ethical decision to cast Judy Garland in this film. I'm not a doctor, but I don't think it's an inappropriate conjecture to say that she plainly demanded extensive medical care at this time, not to go back to work. And it's astonishing that seemingly no one in her life was able to offer that to her. Yes, she had consented to be in the film, but would she have done so had she not been effectively homeless? I personally cannot fathom asking a woman who is very publicly struggling to survive to star in a film that explicitly exploits her worst moments in a role that would pointedly set her up as the butt of the joke. Imagine, after everything everybody already knew about Judy Garland, how absolutely humiliating it would have been for her to deliver this line. I don't need pills like Neely how everyone would have laughed and laughed at the irony and then would have been utterly heartbroken less than two years later when pills actually killed her. Obviously, Garland did the only thing she could do and denied that Neely had anything to do with her. The part is no more me than Judgment at Nuremberg. It doesn't pertain to me. But I don't think anyone was buying it and the press wasn't shy about baiting her with questions about pills, which she skillfully avoided. 
The book deals with, with pills to some extent. Have you found that prevalent around show business people? Well, I find it prevalent around newspaper people, too. <laughs> It's a lot different than Dorothy. Well, I don't take pills in this uh, movie. I think everybody else does. I think Helen Lawson doesn't uh, doesn't need them. You think pills are uh, part of our times then? Well, I think you ought to check with the Lilly Chemical Company. I imagine they seem to be doing rather well. Even Patty Duke expressed skepticism over Garland's casting in her memoir. We never spoke about whether or not Neely was based on her partially because I had my own ambivalent feelings about Judy being in the picture at all. She obviously needed the money, that was why she had accepted, but I thought it was cheap and tawdry to ask her to play the part. And it made me sad that she had reached the point of having to take this stupid role, playing opposite someone who was reputedly playing her. It's tacky, it's degrading, it's undignified to have to do such a thing. And even though she did a lot of undignified things, she was basically a dignified person. Duke, more than anyone, could understand what Garland was going through. Anna Marie Duke grew up in New York City, and it wasn't easy. Her father was an alcoholic and left the family while her mother suffered from severe depression. Her brother had some interest in acting and one day was approached by John and Ethel Ross, managers of child actors who were potentially interested in working with him but became more interested in his seven-year-old sister, Anna. The Rosses took advantage of the chaos in the Duke home and asked her mother to let young Anna live with them to work on her career full time, to which she consented. To the outside world, they did their jobs. They trained her as an actress, got her substantial roles in film and television. She appeared coincidentally in The Goddess as a young Kim Stanley, played 2D in a TV version of Meet Me in St. Louis, was in Wuthering Heights with Richard Burton, and Happy Anniversary with David Niven and Mitzi Gaynor. So by the time she was 10 years old, she was an experienced young actress, but nothing was as ideal as it seemed. Ethel and John Ross were the nightmare version of MGM unto themselves. They gave her a new name, Patty. They insisted she was plain and didn't look like the cute little girls who usually worked in show business. They started giving her alcohol by age 13, had a doctor give her shots of she never knew what, fed her happy pills, though crucially never enough to get her addicted, told her what to say, who to talk to, did nothing to stop her daily anxiety attacks, sexually abused her, took most of her money, and basically robbed her of a childhood. And Patty had to work through all of it. When the Rosses heard of an upcoming play about a young Helen Keller and her teacher Annie Sullivan, They put Patty on an intense training regimen to prepare her to audition for Keller. To teach her how to function without her sight, they blindfolded her in her apartment and would move the furniture around so she never knew exactly what the layout would be. They also drilled her in not reacting to noises or questions to the point that she could tune anything out with ease. One night when she was on stage, a lamp fell from the the grid above and crashed on the stage. And she did not react. I said to her, Patty, how did you not react? And she said, I knew I wasn't supposed to hear it, so I didn't. Patty got the role. The Miracle Worker, if you've seen the film, is a very, very strenuous work. So eight times per week, she'd basically do combat, get her standing ovation, and then go home to the Rosses and hear things like, well, they may all think that you're great, but we know the truth. Thank God for Anne Bancroft, who Duke describes as the saving grace in her memoir. She hero-worshipped her and felt from Bancroft the sense that it was truly possible for someone to care about and accept me, to want me to be intelligent and mature. It's true, every single action I've seen between them makes my heart explode. And Raymond Sobey for all the way home. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, (laughs) When the time came to cast the film, with Anne Bancroft reprising her role, it was only natural for the producers ask a now 15-year-old Duke to reprise hers as well. Both she and Bancroft received rave reviews. In the role of Helen Keller as a child, little Patty Duke is absolutely flawless. In fact, she is incredibly perfect in all the moves and mannerisms required of a very difficult role. 
This reviewer is not one to stick his neck out readily, but if this child doesn't win one or more, what? What is more? What, what are the other awards? Academy Award for her performance as the contentious little Helen Keller. Either the voters' ballots will have gotten lost in the mail, or the members of the Academy Board of Governors can be accused of looking out the window when they should have been watching the picture. The Daily News critic boldly proclaimed, it seems unlikely that either Anne Bancroft or Patty Duke can be overtaken in the race for the Oscars. As they are seen on the screen, it appears they have cinched those symbols of fine film acting. Her prediction came to pass, and in 1963, both Anne Bancroft and Patty Duke won Academy Awards for their performances. If you'd like to know more about Anne Bancroft's win, well, I have covered it at length. Patty emerged the winner in a truly stacked category that included fellow child actor Mary Badham in To Kill a Mockingbird, Shirley Knight in Sweet Bird of Youth, Angela Lansbury in The Manchurian Candidate, and perpetual Oscar bridesmaid Thelma Ritter in Birdman of Alcatraz. By winning at age 16, Duke became the youngest performer in Academy Award history at that time to have won an Oscar. Regarding her acceptance speech, which was literally just, Thank you. Duke wrote in her memoir, I know that thank you was all I said because thank you was all I had been instructed to say when I'd asked John Ross earlier that day. The moment after her Oscar win was a pivotal one. What would be the appropriate career move for a 16-year-old who had just won the industry's highest honor? What next? The answer, television. ABC greenlit a show before they even knew what it would be about, but after spending more time with Patty, the producers came up with an idea. Sidney Sheldon and Peter Lawford and Bill Asher were the producers and Sidney wrote it. Um, he asked that I spend a week or so with his family and him so that he could get a kind of an idea because nobody knew what the show was going to be. It was just the Patty Duke show. Sidney um, decided that that he would he wanted both kinds of both sides of my personality to be represented. And that's how he invented identical cousins. <laughs> but they're cousins, identical cousins all the way. That's right, the Patty Duke show stars Patty Duke as identical cousins. Kathy, a reserved, intelligent youngster with a vague European accent, comes to live with her extended family in Brooklyn Heights because her father's work forces him to travel often and living with them in America would offer more stability. There she teams up with her cousin Patty, the more social, fun-loving one, and hijinks ensue. They switch places, learn from one another, experience average high school drama, etc. Of course, the concept of identical cousins doesn't really make sense, although I guess it is actually one of the more realistic concepts for a 1960s sitcom. ABC explained it by saying, how could you take advantage of her tremendous ability when most teenage roles have become stereotyped long ago? The answer was to unstereotype the role. Instead of giving Patty only one part, give her two parts, identical cousins with diametrically opposed personalities. It's more likely that their actual thought process was, how close to the parent trap can we make this without this actually being the parent trap? Anyway, they definitely were taking advantage of Patty, because she was playing both main characters, she had twice as many lines to learn. And whenever those characters talked to each other or were in the same place, she had to film that scene twice. It was an incredibly demanding assignment for a teenager, especially when you consider that they purposely chose to shoot the show in New York City because New York had less strict child labor laws than California. Had Patty worked in Hollywood, she could have only worked for four hours a day. In New York, she could work up to 12. Once she turned 18 and child labor laws no longer affected her, they moved the production to Los Angeles. Add this to the fact that she was still living with the Rosses, who kept her extremely isolated from people her own age. She wrote in her memoir of this time, I was in the apartment, I was in the studio, we ate in the same two or three restaurants every night, and I never went anyplace else. There was no such thing as walking down the street or going to Bloomingdale's to browse. Plus, I had no real friends, no telephone conversations with anyone. I got all my information from other people on the set, and they probably assumed I knew how the show was doing. 
Given all of this, it's remarkable to look back at these episodes and not see a girl on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Almost every single episode of The Patty Duke Show is available on YouTube, and while I wouldn't call it one of the best shows from that time, it's no Adam's Family or Bewitched, you can immediately understand its appeal and why especially young kids and teens would form an attachment to Patty. She's really adorable and fun. Like, I guess the analogy I would make is that it's kind of like watching a mid-2000s Disney Channel show. Like, you know how Selena or Demi or whoever just dressed a little cooler or had a little weirder adventures or somehow met random famous people, but at the same time still felt like normal teenage girls? That's what the Patty Duke show was for boomers. The numbers, at least in the first season, showed her popularity. According to ABC, she was holding the attention of viewers in 12 million homes a week. So from 1963 to 1967, this is basically all Patty Duke was doing. She starred in just one film, Billy, a musical comedy about a high school girl who loves track and is faster than all the boys because she follows a beat in her head. You can watch it on Prime. It's not very good. and The gender politics are infuriating, but there are a few things here and there that make it fun. Don McKechnie is randomly in it. The athletic sequences are endearingly corny. And there's even an accidental trans ballad. I should have been a boy, but here I am a girl. The film received mid to bad reviews, but I think it's worth mentioning because it presents some relevant issues when it comes to thinking about casting Valley of the Dolls. As one review put it, the star of Billy is called upon to sing a couple songs and to remark that vocalizing is not one of her thespic gifts is an understatement. God bless her. I really genuinely adore Patty Duke, but this critic is not wrong. She had trouble staying in tune, no vibrato to speak of, and can't sustain a note for longer than two seconds. In that dance sequence with Donna McKechnie, they give her the most bland choreography, presumably because at some point they must have realized she doesn't move very well. Like, watch how this number ends. The dancers are doing the most, and then... Patty's also there. The ironic thing is that in 1965, Patty Duke was also kind of a famous singer. At some point during the run of the Patty Duke show, the Rosses decided that Patty should become a bubblegum pop girly. The idea, she writes, was that the acting and the recording would reinforce each other and each area would help you become popular in the other. So Patty Duke recorded an album, and I won't lie to you, I actually really like some of her music, even if, or probably because, it's suspiciously similar to Leslie Gore's. And I'm not the only one because she even managed to get two top 40 hits, Don't Just Stand There and Say Something Funny, which when you consider the songs she was charting with, it's a pretty extraordinary achievement. I made you a Spotify playlist. It's linked in the description below. Are they well sung? No, even she admits that. Does she demonstrate any particular gift for live performance? No. Although I'd argue this one on Ed Sullivan in 1968 is lovely because it's shot in close up and it highlights one of her actual best gifts, which is how expressive her eyes are. That was a major key to her success in The Miracle Worker, and reviews often pointed it out. They don't shoot her at all like this in Valley of the Dolls. Anyway, all of this is to say my question after watching Billy was if your ideal first choice is Barbara Streisand, in large part because of her musical talent. How on earth do you end up with Patty Duke? If Billy spotlights a genuine concern about Duke's casting in hindsight, then I'd argue that so did the rest of her filmography. Prior to Valley of the Dolls, Patty Duke played a child in literally every single thing she did. This is a perennial problem for child actors. How do you grow up gracefully on screen? How do you graduate from being seen as a child when you're very much not one? As the Patty Duke show progressed and Duke herself transitioned from teenager to young woman, these questions became more pertinent. She wanted to grow up, but was struggling to do so on and off the screen. Before its third season, at 18 years old, she married one of the show's assistant directors, Harry Falk, who was 32. Reflecting on this relationship in her memoirs, she explains this marriage by saying that she was probably searching for a father, she barely knew anyone her own age, and most significantly, she believed that marriage would help her move on from the Rosses once and for all. She was clearly very vulnerable, which makes it all the more concerning on his part, and found that when she did actually leave, 
she was entirely unprepared to face life on her own, much less as a wife, for the first time. I felt as if I no longer had an identity. I was no longer associated with the Rosses, so there wasn't anyone telling me what to do. But I hadn't learned how to make dinner, how to make a decision, how to do anything. You can't plan ahead if you've never learned to plan in the first place. Her marriage ironically contributed to her problem being perceived as a child by the public, as journalists voiced their disbelief that Patty Duke is getting married. Yes, you heard right. Patty Duke, the former little girl of movies, is now a big girl. The thing about this announcement that puzzles one at first is that most people just refuse to believe that Patty Duke is old enough to entertain the idea of marriage. Worth mentioning that none of the coverage of their marriage even pauses to consider why a 32-year-old man would be attracted to a girl mostly known for playing a high schooler, which should give you an indication of how exceedingly normal this apparently was at the time. The Patty Duke Show ended after its third season, although old episodes continued airing on television, which only served to extend the idea of Duke as this perpetual child. Her show remains one of the most popular in syndication today, but this very popularity has become a career problem for Patty, noted one paper. It's difficult to build an image of gaining maturity when you're seen five times a week as an adolescent in virtually every major television market in the country. One journalist went so far as to write in a profile of her, the five foot sex pot, attired in a figure revealing sweater and miniskirt, claimed to be Patty Duke. Of course, no one believed her. Anyone who watches television knows that the star of the recent Patty Duke show is a guileless, shapeless, carefree brunette who looks and talks and carries on like a kid just past the threshold of puberty. Aside from one appearance on an episode of The Virginian, Duke didn't work at all between the end of the Patty Duke show and Valley of the Dolls, largely because her mental health was quickly deteriorating. She had just experienced a series of massive changes, leaving the Rosses the end of her show, Marriage, which worsened what she later recognized as symptoms of her undiagnosed bipolar disorder. She became so debilitated by anxiety and depression that, for example, she would hide in closets for hours to avoid going to the grocery store. Shortly after her first suicide attempt, with pills, by the way, she was committed to a psychiatric hospital for five weeks. It is literally right after her release that she auditions for the role of Neely O'Hara in Valley of the Dolls. One would hope that someone in her life would have been like, hey, maybe it wouldn't be a great idea to immediately launch yourself into a role that requires you to enact some of the concerning behaviors you just engaged in. It seems, however, that was not the case. Both Harry and I liked the idea. The book was a bestseller, and we suggested to my representatives at William Morris that this was the part we should really go after. It'll be so startling. I'll make the transition to adult roles overnight. If only we knew. This is something she emphasizes again and again. She really believed Neely was going to be her big chance to break into adult roles, to be accepted as an adult. It was very important to her to assert her independence. I wanted that part and I went after it with everything I had, she said. I wanted a part where I was a mature woman. She screen tested and much like Tate's, everyone who's seen it tends to think that it's better than anything she did in the finished film, including Patty herself. The test convinced Robeson and Duke was offered the role. There was at this point some reason to have confidence. She made a good test and frankly, like Judy, she lent the film a degree of pedigree that the other ladies of the main trio didn't have. She was an Academy Award winner and was still perceived as a highly respected, talented actress, despite the fact that she spent the majority of her time since her win on a slightly silly television show. Critics held the miracle worker in their minds as the benchmark of her talent and the standard against which all of her performances were measured. For example, take that review of Billy. Billy is termed a comedy, although I found it more a tragedy, a definition based on an inexcusable misuse of Patty's ability, if not talent. Anyone who remembers the remarkable performance by this same young lady in The Miracle Worker needs no amplification of this theme. As Robeson told the Chicago Tribune, I had known she was a remarkable young actress as a child, now here she was, a girl in her early 20s. Well, it was a remarkable test. Patty could very well likely be, for her age, one of the best young actresses in the world today. She has energy, vitality, authority. She's a veteran. 
Imagine at that age to be a veteran. Here's where I have to come back to that whole child star thing. Because although people respected Patty's talents, and although she was technically an adult married woman, audiences had essentially no context for viewing her this way. She was mostly Patty and Kathy Lane, and you don't expect Patty or Kathy, especially Kathy, to say something like this. Ted Casablanca is not a fag. And I'm the dame who can prove it. Instead of easing her into mature roles, she landed the highest profile, salacious role possible. And unsurprisingly, the press found this somewhat jarring. The most coveted role for a young actress this year has been the self-destructive singing star Amelia O'Hara in Valley of the Dolls. Patty Duke won the part. Patty Duke? Similarly, what's a nice girl like Patty Duke doing in a movie like Valley of the Dolls? Here's how the character is described in ads for the movie. Neely O'Hara. To her, stardom was too many minks, martinis, and men. Patty Duke? <laughs> I'm not saying she was inherently incapable of doing this role, or that if the public doesn't like or understand a casting decision, that it's automatically bad or shouldn't happen. But what reactions like this do, however, is put a lot of pressure on that actor to prove why she was cast. Meeting expectations isn't enough. You have to exceed them. Patty Duke then was in a very difficult spot. Her mental health was precarious at best. She had to overhaul her persona with one highly anticipated role. And ever since The Miracle Worker, she'd had virtually no experience exercising her considerable talent on adult material. For these four women, Valley of the Dolls was not just another film. It wasn't something they just accepted because they had the time or out of obligation. Valley of the Dolls for each of them had real long-term stakes. Barbara Parkins was rapidly becoming a huge star on television. And even if Anne wasn't the role she really wanted, she believed this film could be what she needed to launch herself to the next level. Sharon Tate had become a big name, though not necessarily for her acting yet. She had a lot to prove, especially to those who were quick to assume she was just like Jennifer, a body. Patty Duke, struggling with her own mental crises, got the coveted, demanding role of Neely, which she hoped would help audiences to finally see her as an adult and help her graduate to more mature roles. Judy Garland was set to make another one of her many comebacks after years away from the screen and hoped that this time she'd be able to prove the cynics wrong and actually finish the film. Would Valley of the Dolls help them achieve their goals? Only time would tell. If you enjoyed this video and haven't already, subscribe to the channel to make sure you see part two, where I dive into what happens on set, why Judy Garland doesn't make it into the final film, why everybody hates Mark Robeson so much, and what happened to these actresses' careers when Valley of the Dolls earns its reputation as film's most beloved piece of shit. I'm going to take a wild guess that if you like Valley of the Dolls, you're probably the kind of person who likes cult classics, finds the in and outs of show business really interesting, and isn't afraid to dive into weird or subversive material. I'd guess that you'd also like some of the things that I like, like Maggie Mae Fish's series Unrated, in which she dives into the history of sex, sexuality, and gender in film, from the silent era to sexploitation to modern erotic movies. This series is a great complement to some of the things I've talked about on this channel, the Hayes Code, Camp, Female Directors, so I can't recommend it enough. I'm so thankful that this series exists, and it's wild to think that in some places, it couldn't. I mean, listen, these films don't, um, necessarily fit YouTube's community guidelines, let's say, but that doesn't mean that they aren't worthy of frank, productive analysis. Thankfully, YouTube isn't the only streaming service that exists. Thankfully, Nebula is a place that's open to these conversations and isn't driven by some suppressive, archaic rulebook. That's why Nebula is the only place where you can watch Unrated right now. Nebula is creator-founded and creator-led, so everyone involved really cares about encouraging creators like myself and Maggie to make the things we're excited to make, not just things that we think will get the most clicks or that fit some arbitrary guidelines. That means we can experiment, dig into niche topics, and try new things. I don't usually do on-camera stuff, but I bravely filmed one of my worst angles in this interview with Alicia Malone, 
and posted it exclusively on Nebula because, well, I was happy I could do that without being afraid of a bunch of weird comments. By subscribing to Nebula, you're not only supporting me, but you're also opening yourself up to amazing exclusive content and, in addition, classes. That's right, now with your Nebula subscription, you can get access to a series of videos in which creators teach you how to create. If you've just finished Unrated and you find yourself thinking, wow, how the hell did she make something like that? All you have to do is make your way over to the Classes tab, and maybe you check out Patrick Willems's How to Analyze Movies class, or Tom Nicholas's How to Research Like a PhD Student class. Even if you just love learning about the creative process or seeing behind the curtain, these classes are well worth your time. If Nebula sounds like the right platform for you, consider signing up for a lifetime membership. For $300, you get lifetime access for as long as Nebula exists. Forget about monthly fees, that's it for life. Signing up using my code in the description below is one of the best ways to support the channel. The money goes directly to me, to the platform development on Nebula, and to creating bigger and better originals for you to enjoy for life. So head on over to the description below, click the links, and have fun watching. Thank you.